when you enter the tabernacle with the holies of holies where we're going to be at now the holies of holies the room was 1500 feet wide 1500 feet long and 1500 feet high those were the dimensions of the holy of holies and let me show you how this fits in what it says in revelations chapter 21 it speaks about the new jerusalem and the new jerusalem they they give the dimensions of the new jerusalem and the new jerusalem the dimensions of it is 1500 miles long 1500 miles wide 1500 miles high coincidence hmm. the holies of holies we're going to find out that's where god was that's where he lived that's where he drilled was in the holy of holies new jerusalem where's god going to dwell in the new jerusalem so to write a book like this the fit revelations all the way over here in the old testament with the holies of holies i don't see how people can say this has contradictions in it there's mistakes in it i haven't found one if you read the bible and read it right i haven't found one there was a place where only one man could enter and then it was only once a year that he can enter and of course this was the high priest this is where God's present was was powerful was in here and that holy of holies because that's where he drilled was in there and the priest was was to go in there once a year now when the priest went in there I don't know if I've shared this with y'all or not but they would tie a rope on his ankle put bells on him because if the high priest was not cleansed if he was not pure when he went in there he would die so they put bells on him to see that they hear that he was still moving but if they heard the bell stop then they knew he was dead and that's why they would pat a rope on him so they could pull him out because nobody could go into the holies of holies but one man and that was the high priest and he better be clean he better be cleansed God's presence in the Old Testament was seen as a fiery glow the smoke that we're going to be talking about it was it was a cloud like smoke and every time God was present it was by fire or by smoke and that you can find in in several in Genesis Exodus Leviticus it, it talks it all through the Bible every time it talked about the Lord God his presence was with smoke or with fire and the holies of holies was set apart dedicated to God only this was the only place he would meet with the with the high priest this was his place on earth on earth <clears throat> and the high priest was the go between between man and God the high priest the man high priest back then God would come down from heaven to be among his people and it says in Exodus 25 8 and let them make me this is the Lord speaking make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them God wants to dwell among us and like I said there is this is where the Lord will meet the high priest to speak to them to the high priest for us in Exodus 25 22 and there I will meet with thee and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the of the testimony which is the covenant of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel on the Ark of the Covenant with the picture y'all see there there was two pieces they had the the mercy seat which was on top and those winged angels that you see that was the top of the covenant that was called the mercy seat Jesus is God's presence among us now it's Jesus that's in among he's the one during his ministry here on earth he was called Emmanuel they said his name would be Emmanuel what does Emmanuel mean in the Bible it says it means God with us now Jesus was to return to the Father and from there he would be what? He would come back as what? The Holy Spirit. The three are one which we learned last week. Hebrews 4.16 Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time, in time of need. Now we, don't have, now we don't have to go to the holies of holies. There's not a place where we have to, 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 to have a man go to <clears throat> and ask for our forgiveness for us now it says here now we can go before the throne which is the Lord instead of going to the holies of holies now we can go directly to him because because of Jesus the high priest being our mediator 
where before it was the high priest in the Old Testament, it was just a man. But Jesus is our, is our perfect high priest now. He's our perfect high priest. <coughs> God expelled Adam and Eve from the garden and placed cherubims to guard the entrance. Because God's presence was in the garden back then. He was in the garden. That's where he met Adam and Eve, talked to them. So he was in the garden. Genesis 3.24 So he drove out the man and he placed the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every one turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. He had the cherubims back in the garden to protect it and cherubims are a class of angels like the picture you see there and they have wings and they have a face as a man but they're guardian angels not our guardian angels God's guardian angels and their purpose was to protect God's holiness that was their purpose the cherubims were, were woven into curtains that separated the courtyard from the holy place they had curtains right there and then it also separated the holy place from the holy of holies so both these curtains had cherubims on them it's, it's not only were they on the curtains but they were also placed on the mercy seat as your picture shows on the curtains there were just like pictures woven onto the curtains but then he, he had he had them ordered to be placed on the mercy seat like that picture that you have the mercy seat which which sat on top of the ark of the covenant there was a high priest he would sprinkle the blood on the sacrificial lamb and this high priest would plead for forgiveness for sins for the nation not from not for man personally that was at the in the courtyard you know, you had, they had an altar in front of the wide gate where they sacrificed animals. That was for individuals. But this one, this sacrifice, this sprinkling of blood on the mercy seat, that was for the nation. Leviticus 16:15. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullocks, and sprinkled it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Like I said, this was only done once a year. This in the Holy of Holies. The reason it was only done once a year, because it wasn't the right blood. It wasn't the perfect blood. It wasn't the perfect blood. Remember, I said before at the beginning that this tabernacle is a shadow of Jesus. So it wasn't perfect. It was, what, it was temporary and it was a shadow of Jesus. And so that's why they only did it once a year. And they and this sprinkling of blood didn't take away their sin. It only covered their sin. Because like I said, it was just temporary until the perfect one came and was sacrificed. These animals were not perfect. They were clean, but they weren't perfect. And like I said before, these animals didn't come voluntarily and say, kill me, kill me. Jesus said, I am willing to die for them. You see, to be a redeemer, you, you had to be three things. For, for the Lord to redeem us, he had to be willing, he had to be able, and he had to be related. And the way he was related was he became man. So that made him related to us. Okay? So he was willing, he was able, because he was able, because he didn't, he didn't have a sin. So he didn't, he didn't have a debt of sin to pay. So he, he had the three qualifications. That's why... Um, he was the perfect sacrifice. The sins weren't taken away until John chapter 1 verse 29. It says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. Remember these Old Testament? These Jews knew the Word of God. They knew it. They had it memorized. All of them. From from. From the time they could start reading, they had them reading the scriptures. Now when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, everyone in that place should have bowed down, should have fell on their face and worshipped Jesus. Because they knew who the Lamb of God was going to be. They knew it was going to be the, the, the final sacrifice because it's all through the Old Testament. Like I said, the Old Testament is all about Jesus. Whatever you read in the Old Testament, it's about Jesus. He says it is. And it says, which taketh away the sin of the world. Does it say sins? It didn't say sins. The sin of the world. What is the, the sin of the world is rejection. 
God came down here. Jesus came down here so we can be saved from not really rejecting Him, which, which that's what people do, but He came down for those who wanted Him could be saved. Those who didn't want to reject Him. So that's why this word is sin. It's not sins. He does forgive sins, but He came down to die so we could have forgiveness of, of uh, not being with Him, to be reconciled to Him. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. That's why I said the word is sin. They're not sins, because they're sins, which is things we do, but then there's a sin, the sin, and that's rejection. That's not. A, that's just plainly rejecting Him. You don't want Him as Lord. You don't want Him as your God. Inside the holies of holies was the Ark of the Covenant. Inside of the Ark were three items. <clears throat> now these three items, one was the stones of tablets of the Ten Commandments. That was inside the, the Ark. Deuteronomy 10.5 And I... I is Moses, and I turned myself and came down from the mount and put the tablets in the ark which I had made, and there they be as the Lord commanded me. They were the written, written word of God. The Ten Commandments was the written word of God. Men break God's commandments, and most of them throw His commandments, they throw them aside. They just completely ignore the commandments of God. Either they do it because they just want to live for self or they're preoccupied with other things. They, they want to do this, they want to do that. You know, they just don't have time for the Lord. Whatever the reason is, it's of the world to reject it, the words of God. But we better realize that that does not take them away. His words are still here. We might ignore them. The world ignores them. But the words are still here. We will face the word of God again one day, all of us. In Psalms 119.89, it says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever. His words, his commandments are forever. They will always be here, no matter if this world throws them aside or not. Matthew 24.35 says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So it doesn't matter how much this world rejects, him, his words, they're still here. They're not going anywhere. They're going to be surprised one day, on the day of judgment, when the, when the Lord brings the word back to them again. John 12, 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in those last days. So even though the world is putting God's words aside, they don't—they're ignoring them, totally having nothing, ha having nothing to do with them. They're going to be brought back to them again on the on the day of judgment. Then they're going to wish, I should have paid attention. Also in the uh, ark, they had the jar of manna, which that's in Exodus 16, 33-34. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein, and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations as the Lord commanded Moses so Aaron laid it up before the testimony which testimony means the ark of the covenant to be kept now the manna placed in the ark was to be a witness to generations to come how God provided for his people that was, that's why they had that in there just to show how God provided manna and everything else they needed while they were going through the wilderness that was just a reminder that God was taking care of them. It was a reminder for them and for us that God takes care of his own. Psalms 35, 20, 37, 25. David says, I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. David said, I've never seen any of his righteous Christians beg for bread. I've always seen He's never forsaken them. Amen? In the New Testament, now this is one I say all the time, but I say it all the time because, believe it or not, people still don't cannot receive this promise. It's this, this promise. This is a promise. People have a hard time receiving this promise. And that's why you hear me say it all the time. But right here is a good place to show it. The manna in the, in the Ark of the Covenant was... To show how God takes care of his, of his people. In Matthew, 
Matthew 6, verses 31 through 34. It says in verse 31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or without where, wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after these things the Gentiles seek. Now what he's saying right there, he says, Lost people. Lost people about worry about what they're going to have tomorrow. You know, how am I eat tomorrow? You know, what am I going to be clothed tomorrow? I mean, they worry about tomorrow. The, the Lord plainly says it right here. This is what the lost people do. Lost people. Then he says, For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. He knows exactly what we need. Amen? Amen. We don't have to worry about tomorrow. Just like he took care of these stubborn idiots. I mean, God took care of them in the wilderness. For 40 years he took care of them. Even though they kept messing up over and over and over. But Lord, the Lord kept taking care of them. Now, now, do we mess up? Well, we're, we're just like the Jews. We mess up too, but the Lord keeps taking care of us. He takes care of us. He says in verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, if you don't want to worry about tomorrow, then put God first. That's plainly what he's saying right here. Put me first, and don't you don't have to worry about it. Eat, drink, clothe. Eat. I will provide whatever you need. And like I said, people cannot accept this. People, well, you know, I better put up for... No, no, no. God says, don't worry about tomorrow. He says, verse 34, he says, Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall be take thought for it, the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. God's saying we have enough to worry about today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Today's the day. Look at today. Live for me today, and I will take care of you. Don't worry about tomorrow. I got tomorrow. You start worrying about tomorrow, then your eyes are off of me. You can't be looking at the Lord when you're looking at tomorrow. You understand what I'm saying? That's why you hear me using this verse all the time, because I'm sorry, but Christians, born again Christians, have a hard time obeying this promise right here. You cannot look at God and put Him first when you're worried about tomorrow. When you're looking at tomorrow. That's why God said, don't look at tomorrow. Put me first, look at me, and I'll take care of everything. Amen? Amen. Christians have a hard time doing it. I know I repeat myself, but I have to. Until I see Christians living the way God wants us to live, I have to repeat these things. Until it sinks into their head, just the way we look at the Jews. Man, how, how can the Jews be so... Dumb. I mean, God did this and God did. Well, we're doing the same thing. When we have a hard time accepting His promises, then we're just like the Jews. Now, also in the in the in the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, it was Aaron's rod, number seventeen ten. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony, <clears throat> to be kept for a token against the rebels, and thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me that they die not the rod it represented the comfort and protection of the obedient ones who's the obedient ones the Christians at least we're, we're, we're supposed to be obedient so it's, it's to show us how he takes care of us that's one reason they had it in their Psalms 23 4 it says yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for thou art with me Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That's why he had the rod put in there. To remind the Christians, he will comfort us. When we need him, he will be there. That's why the rod was in there. But also at the same time, it represented the, set, the chastening and the judgment of the lost ones. The disobedient, those who are lost. Proverbs 26.3 A whip for the horse, a bridle for the ass, and a rod for the fool's back. So it's to, to provide and protect the Christians. But it also represents the rod they has to use to chastise the people who are lost. And that's going to happen. In Proverbs 13.24 He that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth, his, loveth him chastiseth him. Be times. 
And right here saying, if you, God loves us, right? Mm -hmm. And He uses the rod to chastise us. Now right here, He's probably meaning your children. You know, if you don't chastise your children, you don't love them. But it also means that if God didn't chastise us, He wouldn't. He's not loving us. But He does chastise. How many? Don't raise your hands. But how many times have have you been chastised chastised by the Lord? I know I have. But that's because He loves us. He loves us. We're not to get mad at him because he, whatever the way he chastised us, and, and when you're chastised, believe me, you're chastised. The Lord does chastise us. And sometimes it's, I, I have found that sometimes it can be pretty bad. Okay? I don't like being chastised by the Lord. But he does. But we shouldn't get mad at him and leave him. He's doing it because He loves us. Because He wants us to do right. He wants us to be righteous. So anyway, that's what the rod was put in the Ark of the Covenant. To show His protection for us. and But to also show He has to use it for those who dis disobey Him. Also in the Holy of, of Holies, there was a radiant, a radiant shine that came up from the Ark. And it was called the Shekinah Glory. Which is the Hebrew word for dwelling. Because this is where God dwelled. And they had a kind of glory. They had a glow. And that smoke, that fire, it was a glow. In Levit Leviticus 16.2 it says, For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. And this, is, this was the Lord. There was also a cloud that provided shade on the, on the hot sunny desert where, his, where the Jews was at in the wilderness. It provided a, a shade. And the cloud remained over the tabernacle at night around around the Jews and it would appear as fire and provide warmth for the chilly nights. So during the day it would block the sun from them and then at night the fire would provide warmth when it was cool. Again, the Lord taking care of them. Psalms 105.39 He spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give light in the night. You know, for those of you who, who's read the Old Testament and what the Jews went through in the wilderness, how God time after time after time after time had to show them over and over and over, hey, I'm God. Look what I did for you over here. Look what I did for you over here. Look, you know, and he just that he just kept having to do that over and over. Like I said, well, the, the the Jews, they were pretty hard headed. The physical tent, the tabernacle. Or the temple, which later the tabernacle became a temple. That's the Solomon, David's son, built the temple. It was no longer. Because Jesus became the final sacrifice. The tall heavy veil, that was the veil, the curtain with cherubims on it, that was in front of the Holy of Holies, was torn from top to bottom the moment Jesus died on the cross. Because as soon as he died on the cross, he defeated death right instantly he went down to the grave and he preached to to everyone that he preached to the, to the Christians and to the lost because remember when he died he went to paradise because he told the guy next to him that died on the cross he said today you'll be with me today you'll be with me in paradise so Jesus he went down to the grave and preached to the, to the Christians and to the lost he preached to the Christians letting them know hey praise let's go to, let's go home and to the lost, he was telling them why they were there. But as soon as that happened, the the veil to the holies of holies, they said it torn from it tore from top to bottom. Matthew 27 verse 50, 51. Jesus, when he had cried out, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. The torn veil symbolized the free access believers now have through Jesus. Because of, he, because of what happened, the, tor, the veil is torn. There is no more Holy of Holies. Now, we go before the Lord because of Jesus. There is no more Holy of Holies. So God did away with the Holies of Holies. He said, now, because of my Son, you can come to, read to me directly. He is the go-between between me and you. Amen. Now you can only imagine the impact it could, it should have had on the priests. 
Because like I said, the priests, they know the Bible. They know the scriptures. They just didn't want to recognize Jesus as the Son of God. They didn't want to recognize Him as the Messiah. But they know the scriptures. And as soon as that happened, as soon as that happened, they should have fell on their knees. They should have fell flat on the ground and started to worship. God, Jesus, they should, just, they should have started to worship. And some of them did. But they still wanted... They wanted the people to believe in them. You know, the, these religious leaders, they enjoyed it that people always looked to them. They were the boss, the religious boss. Not religious leaders, they were religious bosses because that's what they act like. They wanted people to worship them. They wanted the people to look up at them. Instead of falling on their face, some of them still, hard-headed, didn't, didn't accept Jesus. Acts 6, 7. The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. So some of them did. Some of them, well it says right here, many of them did. But you still, you still had the religious there, the religion there. They were still there, still acting the same way. Same thing, when the rapture comes, you're still going to have people going to church, I mean, the, the rapture is going to be a great sign, but just like these priests who didn't, rec didn't take the sign of the veil being torn, that Jesus was the high priest, the Son of God, they didn't accept it. Well, you'll have church going on after the rapture because they're not going to accept, oh, that was aliens who came and got the people, whatever, whatever they're going to say. It's going to be the same way. But these, these religious leaders, they were determined to have the rule over the people in their lives. That's what they wanted, and that's what they lived for. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 through 20. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable, because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have a great confidence as we hold to the hopes that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. He lead, it leads us through the curtain talk about the holy, the veil. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary, talk about the holies of holies, which Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So right here is just plain and saying, Jesus is now the one we go to. We, we want, when we want to get uh, speak to the Lord, to God, we do it through Jesus. That's what it's saying right here. Amen, amen, amen. I mean, we have a high priest, Jesus. Because of him, the Old Testament, the tabernacle, is no longer. Now all we have to do, we don't have to go nowhere. We could, we could just drop where we're at, no matter where you're at, and start speaking to the Lord. Start speaking to God in the name of Jesus. The, the high priest, the one who was the mediator between God and us, now lives in us. So that's why we can drop right where we're at and start praying to God. Because the mediator, the, the mediator, the high priest, lives in us. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Now it says in the book of Jeremiah, when Israel grew and prospered, they didn't need the Lord anymore. They they got away from this. In Jeremiah three, chapter I mean chapter three, verse sixteen, and it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied, talking about the Jews, and increase in the land, and in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. So the Jews, Israel, just completely got away from the ark of the covenant. Why? Because they were prosperous. They, they increased. Well, I know you're thinking, how stupid are these people? <laughs> really? Seriously? I mean, here they had God right there taking care of them, protecting them, really? and they got away from them. Because everything was going good, they got away from them. They turned their backs on them. When all the blessings they were getting was coming from Him. Yeah. That was coming from why did, they, why did they think they were prospering? Why did they think everything was going so good for them? It was because of the Lord. But what happened? They took. They gave the credit to themselves. Look, look what we're doing. Look what we are doing now. People start getting a good life. Everything's going good. They they got what they want. 
They quit going to church. They quit reading the Bible. They quit living for the Lord. Because now they got so much, now they're busy going hunting. Now they're busy going fishing. Now they're fi busy going camping. Because of all this nice stuff they got, now they don't have time for the Lord. So we do the same thing. We do exactly the same thing. We look at the Jews and think, man, how stupid are those people? Well, we're in the same boat. Now I hope there's some of us who are not that way. We'll keep our eyes on the Lord because we know why we have all these blessings. It's because of the Lord, not because of us. When we start taking credit for it, you're going to have a downfall. Now the tabernacle or the temple is not mentioned again. That was the last time it was mentioned in Jeremiah. But it's not mentioned in, again until Revelation chapter 11 verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, meaning covenant. And there was lightning and voices and thundering and an earthquake and great hell. Now what it's speaking about here, these things are going to happen when God brings his judgment. These are the things that are going to happen. So it's talking about judgment day. That's the next time it's, you, you hear about the Ark of the Covenant. This is when we'll see his vengeance on the unbeliever. The ones who rejected him. Because the Lord does say in Romans chapter 12 verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Amen. So when things happen to us, he says, don't take it upon yourself to pay them back or whatever, to get even with them. He says, no. Nah. He says, vengeance is mine. I will take care of that. And the day he's going to take care of it, it might not be now, we might not see it, but he will take care of it because he says on the day of their judgment, vengeance is mine. That's when he's going to bring it on them. So even though we don't see it now, and even though we, we, we see somebody or people and we think, man, how are they getting away with that? Well, believe the Word of God. They will pay for it. They will pay for it. They will pay for rejecting the Lord. And they will pay for things they've done to us. Now, I have a teaching on that. I forgot what I called it. I think it's called When Satan Attacks. I think that's the title of it. But I, I speak about that. How when lost people attack us. But that's another subject. But vengeance is mine. So praise God. It's not like, praise God, man, he's going to get his one day. It's not that way. <laughs> so when I said praise God, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, because we should, really, we should pray for them. Even though they've misused us, took advantage of us, we should still pray for them. Because as far as I know, I don't know anyone, anyone, that I would want to see go to hell. Because hell is for real, it's forever, and it's a forever torment. And truly, 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 I really, from my heart, I don't want to see anybody go there. I don't care how bad you are. I don't care how many people you've killed. I don't want to see that. I want to see them pay, you know, in other ways, like stay in prison away in, in prison for the rest of your life. Or even if you have to be put to death. Hopefully they get saved before they get put to death. But to hope that on somebody, I wouldn't hope that on anybody. Hell is for real and it's only the devil and his demons should go through. Now for the believers, the ones who are born again Christians, we're going to receive the covenant blessings. They're going to receive the vengeance of God. That's what they're going to get. But we, Christians, are going to receive blessings. One is going to heaven, and then there's going to be blessings on rewards. You know, what kind of walk did you have on earth as a Christian while you were here? What kind of walk did you have? Did you walk with the Lord? Did you do the things he said to do? Did you obey him? Because there's going to be rewards for Christians in heaven. Now for some of us, for some Christians, I'm sure there's going to be great rewards. Like John the Baptist. He gave his life for the Lord. He lived in the wilderness. He separated himself from the world. And he preached and baptized for Jesus. Now I'm sure he's going to get some great rewards. And there's going to be others. But then there's going to be some for the Christians who all they did was go to church on Sunday. That's pretty much all they did. They got born again. They gave their life to the Lord, but they, that's pretty much where it started and ended. They got born again. They believed in the Lord, and they gave Him their heart, but they didn't do anything for Him. Now, there's not going to be any rewards there. They'll make it to heaven, but that's it. But anyway, what I'm saying is, we've got some blessings coming. 
I mean, you think these, we think these are blessings what we have now? This ain't nothing compared to what's going to be in heaven. <laughs> Amen. Now let me say a little more about the altar. The altar is where they had to have blood to have sacrifice for forgiveness. Hebrews 9.22 And almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. The shedding of blood was done at the altar. Sin is paid for by the blood at the altar. The altar is the place where we receive our forgiveness. Leviticus 17.11 For the life, the life, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. The atonement. It's the blood that brings us back to the Lord. That we can be reconciled to the Lord. Life is in the blood. And that has to go on the altar. It was Jesus' blood that paid for our sin. And it is Jesus' forgiveness that we have forgiveness now. Because him paying with his blood on the altar, having the, the final sacrifice, having the victory over death, because of that, now we can go to him for forgiveness. And Jesus is the altar. He was, on, he, he was sacrificed on the altar, but he also is the altar. He is the altar. Now there's Jesus who lives in us. So if Jesus lives in us, where's the altar? In us. In our heart. The altar, let me say this, the altar is not at the church in front of the, up there in front. You know, you hear preachers say, you know, come up to the altar. Well, to them it might be a altar, but it's not the true altar. Okay? So make sure you don't, people, some people believe going up there is special. There's nothing, and I don't care if you like this or not, but there is absolutely nothing special about going up to the front and praying. There's nothing special about that. In fact, I would say the, the Lord is not very pleased with that anyway. Because you're supposed to pray where? In your closet. So what do these people when they go up there? For show? It's either for show or they've been misled and they think there's something about going up in front that's special. Either way, it's wrong. Now, like I said, this is not this might not be accepted by very many people, but it's the truth. The altar is in you. When you pray, you pray right where you're at. There is no special place to go to. You pray where you're at. Wherever your closet is, that's where you go. If it's in your car, if it's in your house, if it is in your closet, wherever it is, that's where the altar is. That's where you go to pray. Because part of, of the altar is where you go to worship. Because when you're praying, what do you do when you pray or supposed to do? You're supposed to worship the Lord before you even start asking for things for ourselves. You praise Him. Tell Him how great He is. How beautiful He is. Thanking Him for all the blessings. And then when you've done that, now you say, Lord, I want to pray for so and so or for whatever. But part of being at the altar is worshiping the Lord. In Hebrews 13, verses 10 through 15, I'm not going to read the verses, but it says, we have a new altar, and it is Jesus. It says it in Hebrews 13. In who we should offer sacrifice of praise to God. That's what those verses say. Jesus is our altar, and we should offer our sacrifice of praise. Because we no longer have to sacrifice animals or anything. But now Hebrews says, now this is where we should sacrifice praise to God. At this altar. Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Because of Jesus' blood and resurrection, now we can, now you can forgive us of our sins and carry us to the true tabernacle. Remember, now Jesus is the true tabernacle. The, tra the tabernacle in the Old Testament was just a shadow of the true tabernacle. <coughs> okay? You understand? That was just a shadow. Now we have the true tabernacle. The true tabernacle is the invisible heaven. We can't see heaven now, but it's there. It's there. We can't see it, but the true heaven is the true tabernacle is there. Just like Jesus, we can't see Jesus, 
but we know He's there. Amen? Amen. Now, how do we get to God and have fellowship with Him? <clears throat> Through the tabernacle. Through the tabernacle. After what we've just learned about the, everything in the tabernacle, how do we get to Him? How do we have fellowship with Him? Well, it tells us the tabernacle, the tabernacle plainly shows the whole process of becoming a Christian. Blood was shed at the bronze altar. The first thing when you entered the tabernacle was the bronze altar and that's where you sacrifice. Blood sacrifice. It was animals but it was blood sacrifice and what did they do it for? To get forgiveness. Yeah. Then they had the, the bronze lever. That's where you would wash and cleanse yourself. You would cleanse yourself with the bronze lever. And then there was the light. That was inside the courtyard. Now you went into the holy place and in the holy place they had the lampstand which was the light. Our light. Jesus is the perfect light. That's what the lampstand represented. Was Jesus. The light of the world. Then you had the bread. The show bread. That was to represent his words. Jesus' words. We needed those words. We needed that. We need that bread to know what we're doing. And then there was the the altar of incense. And what was that? That was for prayer. So you had, you in that tabernacle you had all the steps that you had to take to become a Christian. And all that all them objects in there I've showed you and, and showed you exactly what they were for and everything. This is an exact shadow of Jesus, the tabernacle. After all this, now you can enter into the presence of God. Now I tell you all this because this is the tabernacle teaching. Now, I will show you the tabernacle, which later was the temple. Okay? We, un we got the picture of what the tabernacle is and how it represents Jesus. We got all that, right? Yeah. Now, I'm going to show you how the temple is Jesus. All that that we just studied, everything about the tabernacle, the temple, I'm going to show you how it's Jesus today. Matthew 12, 6. This is Jesus. But I say unto you, that in this place is one greater than the temple. Jesus was saying, I'm greater than this temple. Why was he greater than the temple? Because the temple was just made by men. That building, that temple was made by men. Jesus wasn't made by men. He said, I'm greater than this temple. Because he was the, high, the perfect high priest. John chapter 2 verses 19 through 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, talking to the priests, talking to the religious leaders, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, forty and six years was this temple in building and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Verse 21. But Jesus spoke of the temple of his body. So right here Jesus is saying, I'm the temple now. I'm the temple. Amen? Amen. These, these religious leaders were talking about a building that took 40 and 6 years to build. Jesus said, no, I'm talking about me. I'm the temple. I'm going to raise in 3 days. Not this building material is going to raise in 3 days. I'm going to raise in 3 days because I am the temple. Amen? Now Jesus is calling himself the temple here. So if he's the temple and he lives in us, now... We can understand the verses that I'm about to read. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? Amen? amen. I better hear some amens. Right <laughs> we are the temple of God. We are. And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. This is why we're the temple of God. Because God dwells in us. Where was God before? God dwelled in the Holy of Holies. But now we're the temple, so now God dwells in us. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay? I mean, come on. Think about what, I, what we just read. We are the temple. We are that tabernacle. Everything that I just taught on the tabernacle is us. Hmm. <laughs> Amen. I mean, is this just too much for y'all to understand? Do y'all hear me? Yeah. We are the temple. We, we are that tabernacle that I just took. What? Four, four, uh, four nights to, to teach on. We're that temple. We're, Amen. Verse 17. If any man defile the temple of God, 
Him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. You are my temple. And it says, if any man tries to defile you, and defile means destroy you, or or if any man comes to you with another gospel trying to take you away from the gospel of God, of Christ, of Jesus, God said, I will destroy him. That's what I'm saying. Vengeance is his. God says, if any man, now you have you have a religion out there that take this as if we destroy the temple that God will destroy us now I guess if you take your brain away a little bit I guess you could get that that, he's, that it says that if you if we destroy the temple ourselves then God's going to destroy us but no that's not what it's saying it says if any man defile the temple if any man defiles us he will destroy. Amen. Because we are the temple. I mean, that's, out of this whole teaching, I think this is the number one thing right here. Out of all the teaching, this verse has got to be the number one for us to grab onto. You know what? All that is us now. We are the temple. Mm. Amen. We just learned how important things were in the temple, right? We just learned how important they are. They're still important today. They're just as important. Everything that I've taught, how important it was, is just as important today in us. Also in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 17. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with the devil? Or what port hath he that believeth with an unbeliever? And what union hath the temple of God with idols? Again, again, he's calling us the temple. What, what business do we have with these, these people who are lost? That are living in darkness. What business do we have with them? Is what he's saying right here. For ye are the temple of the living God... And God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. He's talking about us. Amen. Amen. He will be our God. All we need to do is be his people. Verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, be ye separated, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So part of becoming a Christian is what? Part of becoming a temple is what? Leaving the unclean behind us. And anything that is lost is unclean. Anybody who is lost is unclean. We are now the tabernacle. We are now the temple. And as I shown that the temple was purified, was cleansed, was of the Lord. Totally of the Lord. Amen. Now, we can have friends who are believe, who are non-believers. We can have friends. We can talk to them and stuff. But the thing is, what it separates us is that we don't do what they do. You know, we, like, we love talking about our Father. We love talking about the Lord. We love living for Him. Lost people aren't going to want to do that. So either they're going to do that with you, or you're going to do what they want to do. So, since you're not going to do what they want to do, and they're not going to do what you, what, what you want them to do, well, you need, you need to be separated. You can be friends, and you can pray for your friends. Especially pray for them when they're lost. But when he says being separated, he's not saying to ignore them. He's saying don't do the things they do. They live in darkness. You don't live in darkness anymore. You live in the light. You live with the Lord. They're still living for the devil. So he says, be ye not unequally yoked. So don't mix yourself with a lost person. Don't let darkness into your life. Because you have the light. And the light overpowers the darkness. Amen. So you can do it. If you fall to the darkness, it's because you were willing. It was because you wanted to. It wasn't that the devil made you do it. It wasn't that your friends made you do it. You did it on your own. You made the choice and said, well, I'm going to enjoy this part for a little while. Well, a little while sometimes doesn't stay a little while. Like the Bible says, a little leaven, a little sin 
goes a long way.